So I guess now I'm the brick. Uh, it's still the original invest, Neil. I'm the brick. No, I think I'm the brick. I think I am now the brick. I think it's pretty obvious, Neil, that I always was and I always will be the brick. Welcome to the GCN Show. This week, we take a look at all of the major races that took place over the last seven days, and we finally catch up with Simon Richardson at the Vuelta Andalusia, where he caught up with the race on the last stage. Yeah. So the Vuelta Andalusia has... <laughs> Sai, I would never let someone walk in front of my shot and get away with it. Sort it out. Uh, anyway, we've got all of our usual features as well, which are tweet, caption, comment of the week, plus a return of our club of the week, and finally, of course, extreme corner. Ready? 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 You guys ready? Let's start with the Tour of Oman, where Andrea Guardini opened up his season account with a sprint win on stage one, and then Fabio Cancellara also opened his account on stage two with some aggressive racing. Yeah, but the big news, for us at least, came on stage three. A few of you may have noticed that on our top ten rides to watch in Oman, we omitted somebody called Alexander Kristoff. You heard of, heard of him? Uh, Apparently he's won San Remo, a couple mm. of stages of the tour, and he won half the stage in Qatar a few days before Oman. Anyway, we, we missed him out and we had all of our fingers, toes and everything else crossed that he'd go down a couple of levels and not do anything in that race. But he didn't. He won stage three, basically sealing our embarrassment. Apologies to all of you who were offended. Yeah, but uh, anyway, the big showdown of the race came on stage four with the ascent of Green Mountain. Now, TJ Van Garderen looked absolutely superb and dropped some of his biggest rivals, rivals including uh, Nibali and Valverde. But nobody, him and us included, expected the challenge to come from the Spaniard on the Lamprey Merida team, Rafa Valls. Now, he attacked within about a kilometre of the finish and took enough time to take the overall lead, which he and his team duly defended for a surprise win at the finish. Before we finish with Oman, I think it's worth mentioning that Eddie Merckx, the race director and overall cycling legend, was not too happy with some of the riders uh, who decided to cancel stage five. Let's take a look. That can naturally the Ronde van Oman in in gedrang brengen. Ja, we just hopen van niet de renners. Ik heb daar geen problemen met voor de renners, maar maar. And it seems that Merckx's frustrations haven't subsided since the race finished. In an interview with the Dutch newspaper The Telegraph, he said that the Tour of Oman will be taking place in 2016, but maybe without a few of the key teams. Anyway, if you didn't catch up with some of the action from the Tour of Oman, we've got daily highlights, so just take a look on the channel. Thanks for joining us during a Tour of Oman that went from sublime to ridiculous and pretty much everything in between. Give this video a thumbs up and let us know in the comments which race you'd like us to cover next. Now it's time for caption of the week. Last week's photo of world champion Matthew Vanderpool bunny hopping. The winner, Ozzy Kopite, with the caption, after noticing the brand of bike, this is the closest a Stevens will get to a cyclocross world champion. <laughs> and I think he's referring to you, Matt Stevens. Just but didn't you get quite close in on that practice lap when you're rolling back I, down the hill? Yeah, you almost I, mean, I, him. I nearly knocked him over, but you know. I'm, yeah. You usually get pretty close when you get lapped as well. Anyway, well done, Ozzy Kapai. Get in touch and we shall be sending you something in the post. This week's photo is of a couple of riders coming out of Portaloos or Porta Potties in the Tour of Oman. Porta Potties. Porta Potties. Well, there you go. We've got our mate uh, Domestique has started us off this week and Dom has suggested why are there are only two here. I thought it was called a toilet. <laughs> That's our kind of standard, that. Well done, Dom. Have you ever used a, a portaloo, Matt? Last week, Dom had a pretty successful one hour on Twitter using the hashtag AskDom. Now, all sorts of questions were asked, including his favourite cheese and also his legends of the peloton. And he also had a few words of wisdom. Check this out. Being average is okay. Trying to be average is not okay. 
What advice. It's just a sage, isn't it? Uh, Dom has managed to get over 1,000 followers already, and apparently, once he gets over 2,000 followers, he's going to do another one hour of Ask Dom. So make sure you follow him. His Twitter handle is at Dom underscore GCN. Three major talking points from Vuelta Andalusia. The first, JJ Lobato. The second, high speed crashes. And the third, Froomey v Berti. When movie stars JJ Lobato finished fourth at the Milano San Remo last year, he became a r real rider to watch. He's fulfilled that prophecy thus far in 2015. He won a stage at the Tour Down Under and then backed it up with two stage wins in Andalusia, both ahead of German J John Degenkolb, both difficult sprint finishes, making him a major threat heading into this year's Milano San Remo. Yeah, he's looking fantastic. But as I said, high speed crashes, stage 1A, Matt. No. Loads of riders hit the deck at an absolutely tremendous speed. And one of the worst teams affected was the Lotto Jumbo team of the Netherlands. Seems like half their riders were on the ground. Here's a picture of Moreno Hofland, who had a chain ring go into his leg. Mm. Looks like a shark bite. And here's another picture of uh, Lawrence Tendam taking a kind of mirror selfie. Looks like he's left half his skin in Spain. Oof. Nobody better to talk about the race itself and the main battle that was fought out on the slopes of Andalusia. That's our man on the ground, Simon Richardson, and he caught up with race winner Chris Froome too. So the Vuelta Andalusia has just finished behind me. Thank goodness, to be honest with you, I've been waiting here all week, but it's been absolutely brilliant. Of all the racing that's been going on this week, this has certainly been the most interesting with a view to the season long. Chris Froome ultimately coming out on top ahead of Alberto Contador by just a couple of seconds. Let's take a look, hear what Chris Froome has to say. So after you lost time to Alberto on, on both those stages, well, how are you feeling? I'm still in a, I mean, I came out of that stage and I think it, even in the interviews I did afterwards, I was saying I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at. The legs felt good, everything was good, even though I'd lost time. So, um, yeah, I mean, we went into the next stage still with that same attitude and we're going to do as much as we can. And um, that was obviously the day Alberto cracked a bit. So, um, yeah. So, some absolutely fantastic racing already in yeah. February. It looks like Froome and Contador are absolutely flying. But on the other hand, Neil, over in Oman, last year's Tour de France winner Vincenzo Nibali was not nowhere to be seen, but certainly not where you'd expect him to be. No, he was about three minutes off the pace. And it, yeah, it brings up a really interesting conversation because when I saw Contador attacking, distancing Froome, I thought, wow, it's pretty early for him to be in that sort of form. He says he wants to peak in May, he says he wants to peak in July. When Nibali was asked about it, he said, hey, it's only February, I don't need to be flying. I think the rivalry between Contador and Froome tends to bring out a bit of the competitiveness and they go harder than they would otherwise. But, uh, you know, it worked for Nibali last year. He came into the season slow and just sort of built all the way up to July and won the tour. So who are we to question? It does look like they're genuinely flying. I mean, yeah, they were ding dong at the front, but the gap to third place on both those stages and overall in Andalusia was massive. Yeah, it was a fantastic spectacle on, on those, those, those two finishing climbs. Great, great for the sport, great for the fans. And, and great for Alberto and, 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 and Froome because they both got a win under the belts. Obviously, Froome has come out on top by two seconds, but for me, the, the way, just the way they rode it, it is like it's in, in July and they did come into the race saying they both wanted to win, but also the way Sky rode tactically, they had a great weekend winning out, you know, obviously the Tour of Algarve as well, but rather than seeing the Sky train trying to drop everybody, they attacked, they, they rode in a far more punchy kind of fashion and I don't think I've ever seen Chris Froome attack like the way he did. It's, it, Gives a new extra dynamic to things, and I, for one, am absolutely salivating at the thought of what's going to happen in Serena Adriatico. Yeah, where well, we can throw it in Vincenzo Nibali and Nairo Quintana into the mix. It's going to be fantastic. Cast your mind back to our 1,000th video. <laughs> that featured this man here, the boss, Dan Lloyd, putting in an absolutely electrifying performance up the Col de Madone. Well, who really is the fastest? It's the question on everybody's, or well, nearly everybody's lips. Simon Richard had a chat with Chris Froome to get to the bottom of this quandary. Who is the fastest up the coal? De Madone. Electrifying. De La Madone. Whatever. I'm sure you're aware that Dan Lloyd is the current uh, record holder at the Col de Madone after a, an electrifying performance back in October. Is that something that you're an looking at? Performance an electrifying performance, yeah. Is that something you're looking at, uh, you know, perhaps taking that record back? I heard unofficially that you are the record holder. He's, he's done a, a low 30s, I think. Uh, no, low 30s, I think. 
low, low 30s, but it doesn't cut it at all. I think, uh, I think you're going to have to have a chat to Richie Porter about that one. Is Richie the current record holder? Richie's, uh, Richie's definitely uh, quicker up there than I am, so you're going to have to have a chat to him right, about so it. So we heard it here first, Daniel Lloyd is no longer the record holder. Yeah, right, there we go. Just, do you reckon Chris remembers Lloydy? Looked a bit nonplussed on no, that, really. Well, he wouldn't recognise the face, would he? Because he's always behind me. <laughs> Come on, Dan, stop whinging. While Team Sky was winning in Spain, they were also winning next door in Portugal at the Tour of Algarve. The team was there to ride for Richie Porte, but when Garrett Thomas got into a breakaway on stage two, he took 30 seconds on the main GC rivals, including world champion Mikel Kwiatowski, and held the lead all the way to the finish. Porte went on to win a mountain stage and take the KOM jersey. This week's marginal pain comes from Neil. Take it away. Yeah, my marginal pain is people who show up for a group ride with no means to correct a flat tire. Mm. No pump, mm. no CO2, no tire, no tire lovers. Just expecting everybody else on the ride to take care of them. And the best example I have of that actually was not somebody I was riding with, but at the Tour of California Grand Fondo a few years ago, I saw a guy pull over on the side of the road. So in essence, I used my last one for him, and as I rode away, I thought, you selfish. That's a, that's a good one, there. <laughs> Just f***ing through the whole thing, I swear. <laughs> In Paris, the World Track Championships were held over the last week. Three main talking points that came out of that event, including Anna Mears taking an 11th world title. This time around, she won the Kirin, making her an all-time record holder for rainbow jerseys on the track. Well, yeah, second point and one that really stood out to me was Fernando Gavir. Now, a lot of you will remember him from back at the Tour de San Luis. He was the 20-year-old who beat Mark Cavendish twice on sprint stages. He managed to take out the Omnium and beat road pros such as Elia Viviani along the way. And apparently, he's headed up to Belgium now for some tests with the Etics Quickstep team. Mm. Mm, but uh, uh, the country that's been most dominant in uh, track car racing for the last uh, 15 years, the Great Britain, didn't come away with one gold medal for the first time in 14 years. Now that's quite incredible and in stark contrast to the success that Team Sky had pretty much in the same week. So what's afoot? Leave your comments down below. Certainly food for thought. Some sad news now. Belgian cycling legend Claude Croquillion sadly passed away last week at just 58 years of age in Aust. Now, amongst the many victories that he had over his professional career were the 1984 World Championships and the Tour of Flanders three years later. Yeah, he really was a rider. When I was young, who I looked up to, I think I posted him on my walls and saw him up close in the Tour de France in 1986 and a real sad loss uh, for cycling. Club of the week. There we go. <laughs> Well, there's, there's our intro anyway. <laughs> Club of the Week time, and this week comes in from Michael Dennis. He said, I'd love for you to put in CC Hackney, a club based in East London. I've been riding with them for about nine months, and I already feel like they're my family. I raced them at the weekend in my first race, and it was great to be able to represent them in my debut. I attend the under-18 sessions, and we often train at the Lee Valley Velo Park. And I have many great experiences with the club, and everyone there loves GCN, including myself. And interestingly, actually, they've got Terry Gegenhart as one of their previous riders and a couple of other guys that have gone to pro teams. So, sounds like they're doing a great job. If any more of you have got some clubs or local teams which you think might be deserving of a mention on GCN, we're going to be doing it for the next couple of weeks, so leave your suggestions in the comments section below this video. Right, it's time now for Comment of the Week. And it's been sent in by Peter Tollan, who suggested we go over to Italy and ride up the Scanupia climb. Now, this isn't a climb I've ever heard of, but it seems absolutely fascinating. Apparently, you climb 1,200 metres in six kilometres. Now, my maths is fortunately pretty good. That makes, uh, for an average gradient, chaps, of 20%. Very steep indeed. Now, the sign at the start of the infamous, uh, infamously warns of 45% gradients. Now, I've worked that out as kind of really steep. Just kind of, yeah, just really steep. But there you go. Is that, is that it for comments? Were, were there, was there any comments about no. my debut last no. week? No, nothing at all, mate. No. All right. On the channel this week, on Wednesday, it's how to calculate your functional threshold power. FTP is a term that you hear a little bit on GCN, and it stands for your functional threshold power. 
In this video, we're going to tell you how you can find your FTP, or if you don't have a power meter, the equivalent with a heart rate, which is your functional threshold heart rate. On Thursday, we'll look at the top five riders in the upcoming Omloop Het Newsblad and Kerner Brussels Kerner. And on Friday, wait for it, it's the bikes that are going to be used in the women's peloton this year. Now, we know we've said that for the last two weeks, but well, we don't promise, but we're hoping that that will come out then. And on Saturday, we're going to take a closer look at Alejandro Valverde's Team Canyon bike. On Sunday, off the bike at Dan's house. And on Monday, how to fit a chain catcher. These are reasonably common and have become so over the last few years. And they're basically designed to stop your chain from dropping off the inner chain ring down here onto the bottom bracket. <laughs> <laughs> off the bike. You know what I said? Yeah. Shit, did I really? I didn't want to say it. <laughs> off the bike. Can you corner? Tweet of the week. We have two tweets for you this week. The first from the cycling snob. Hashtag I'ma let you finish. Hashtag Beyonce should have won the tour. Yeah, and continuing the theme of photoshopped photos. The second one comes in from Karen Rice, who says, Tom Lars and Cy Richardson, new bestseller about Matt and myself. Never double dip, 50 shades of gilet. Or as Americans say it, 50 shades of gilet. No, actually, Americans would say 50 shades of they? vest. Oh, 50, yeah. wouldn't it? 50, 50. shades 50. of vest. Yeah. Anyway, it's a, a stone cold classic, isn't it? Look at that. Something special about that picture though, Dan, I must admit. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, but I feel like in this case, I think you're yeah, right. you, can. you know it's going to be a good book. You do, you <laughs> certainly do. As per usual, we're going to finish the show with Extreme Corner, which this week comes to you from Tom Lars. Ready? Ready. 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 We're ready. Mm -hmm. Ready. 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 For sake. Ready? Ready? Go. This time, not gonna f up. Ready? Is that right? Okay, ready? 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 Oh, sh ready? 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 I'm Tom Last, by the way. Don't put that in. Right, ready? Yeah. Ready? Ready? Mm. You right? Ready? Ready? Yeah. Ready? 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 I just covered out with sh Ready? 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 Were you recording all that? I see uh, Steph on Twitter has been hard at work and now you Neil are immortalised in Lego to join the rest of us. Looking great in pink. Yeah, that was quick work from Steph and it's obviously a big honour. Uh, the yes. likeness is uncanny. And, and you've even got your own cheerleaders. I mean, we haven't even got cheerleaders. No. We've been doing this a couple of years. I know, it's a bit... I've actually Good had stuff. cheerleaders sort of follow me throughout my life, so that's actually not uncommon. Right, mm. okay. I haven't. Weird. Mm. For race reports from the Tour of Oman, click down here. And if you are quite fond of that Fifty Shades of Gilet cover, and you want to see our uh, video of how to prevent getting a sore bottom, click up here. And finally, if you'd like to subscribe to GTN and you haven't already done so, it's absolutely free. Click on the cheerleader. You can get us in your inbox. How cool is that? Amazing. Thanks for taking a minute to chat with me. I just wanted to get a bit of feedback from you and a few tips uh, about all the charisma that you exude. Well, I think just don't take it to heart, Neil. Some people really have a heart of stone. So how would you define charisma? Charisma is a compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others, Neil. <laughs> Have I got to do it without swearing? Yeah. That's not going to be half as funny. <laughs>